repositories and how do you make them uh, friendly on the web and uh, towards uh, machines. So I intended to um, uh, talk about one topic only. Yesterday, after listening into a couple of sessions and all, and particularly the breakout sessions, I decided to add an, uh, a second topic to my talk today. And uh, I hope I'll be able to convince you that uh, both of these technologies and concepts, while distinct, they are related, and uh, they are, A, uh, addressing very real uh, um, problems that we're facing in, in this community, A, B, they're very simple uh, to implement, uh, and C, that they are, uh, um, uh, especially due to the fact that they're simple to, simply uh, implemented, uh, able to have a real impact on, uh, on our lives and our um, re uh, repositories as, as they are. Um, they, um, uh, just to get started, maybe um, uh, do. Uh, of course, can we say that this is not a uh, this is a team effort, right? This is not just me uh, telling you this is what I did in the last two years in my little uh, dark chamber somewhere. This is a team effort, so I'd like to acknowledge a number of people that have contributed um, uh, over the years uh, to these uh, concepts and technologies. Most importantly, Herbert Van Zandt, my boss and the team leader of the prototyping team in the research library at Los Alamos. So I'm diving right in into uh, the first topic that I'd like to talk to you about, uh, and that topic is on uh, robustifying uh, your links on the web uh, from repositories. Uh, this concept and this technology basically addresses two main problems. The first one is, um, uh, sure you're very familiar with this uh, scenario, it's link rot. So you browse an uh, uh, individual web page like the IOPC General Assembly web page from 2013, uh, you bookmark the page, for example, this is what you see. If you come back to the very same uh, page, uh, you get this, right? Uh, not only is this an error, not only does the web page uh, tell you it's not there anymore, but in this case in particular, I'm actually blamed for breaking the internet. Uh, so this is obviously not what uh, the page is supposed to look like. And uh, uh, the irony in this particular example is that IAPCD, IAPC, stands for the International Internet Preservation Consortium. So, <laughs> so that's the first problem that uh, this, this concept uh, uh, addresses. The second problem is a bit more subtle, and we call this content drift. Uh, if you went to the EPA website on climate change in 2016, you saw this. Uh, this is the EPA telling you about climate change uh, and what happens uh, in the world. If you browse to the very same address today, you get this. Obviously the content is different. Uh, without getting uh, political here, uh, this is more difficult to, um, uh, uh, to detect, of course, because that's not an error. Right? Your browser will not tell you, I could not find the resource that you were looking for. You will get an HTTP 200 response code saying everything is okay, uh, but the content, of course, has shifted. So if you translate these two scenarios now, link rot and content drift, into the realm of scholarly communication, so I write an article, I reference website, for example, the EPA website, uh, in 2016. You read my article today, you follow my reference, and you get this. Obviously, there's a disconnect, right? Obviously, this is not what I, as the author, in 2016, intended when I referenced the EPA website. So, in, uh, in short, this is the problem that we're trying to address here. The notion of link rot and content drift together is what we coin uh, for, uh, uh, as uh, reference rot. Right? So these two phenomena together are um, uh, reference rot. And um, the, um, the, the, um, the problem is that basically all links on the web that we're referencing from the now scholarly articles are subject to that sort of reference rot. It's not under our control. We're referencing a resource that sits somewhere on someone else's machine, on someone else's server that's not under our control. So we investigated this uh, a number of years ago in more detail, and uh, were able to publish um, um, particular two uh, papers in PLOS One about this. Uh, the left one uh, focused more on the notion of uh, link rot, and the right one more on the notion of uh, content drift. And I'll share those slides, so there's no need to copy and paste those uh, uh, URIs here. Um, in, those in those two articles, we assembled a vast corpus of scholarly articles and looked at all their references to what we call uh, resources at the web at large. So those are references not to other scholarly articles, 
but to you know, your blogs, your videos, your Wikipedia pages, those sort of um, uh, resources that are again not under the custodianship of uh, uh, scholarly publishers. So everything basically that does not have a DOI, if you will. Right? So um, we looked at re uh, references that are, what the, again, we call uh, references to the web at large, not um, references to other scholarly articles. A little bit of eye candy to give you a very, very brief, high-level overview of the findings of these um, uh, papers, of these pieces of research. This is a diagram of all, uh, our three, the linkage uh, of our three scholarly uh, corpora on the right-hand side, Archive, Elsevier, and PMC. We sampled millions of uh, Elsevier articles. We uh, uh, investigated the entire archive, physics, preprint, corpus, and we also looked at all articles published by PMC. And uh, uh, those, those linkages um, uh, show you the top level domains that they link to, right? So for example, there's a solid uh, line between the uh, physics preprint archive and their links to the .edu domain. So that's the, uh, the status as is, and everything that is gray in now is uh, link rot. Right? So those links are not there anymore, not reproducible anymore from today's perspective. Uh, compared to what it was uh, published, right? So that's a shocking picture. Another way of visualizing this um, from the second uh, plus one paper that we published is uh, this graph. Uh, this now goes over time, so on the x-axis you see the time articles were published starting in 1997 going all the way to 2012. The black part of this graph is link rot. So that's the percentage of references to web at large resources in those published articles that are dead. They do not work anymore. And the different colors of blue, the different shades of blue here, represent the notion of content drift. So how much have those reference resources changed over time? And the lightest shade of blue on the top there uh, represents the fraction of reference that have not changed at all. So to give you an example, articles published in 2012, of those articles, uh, a bit more than a, a 20, uh, with roughly 23, 25% of references have not changed at all uh, within three years later, so uh, 2015 when we uh, ran that study, right? Which means three quarters of references are either dead or have changed to some extent. Again, uh, uh, driving the notion that we're losing our scholarly record, but we're not, uh, we're not able to reproduce references that the author intended to convey in his or her uh, scholarly article. So what can we do about this? Uh, coming to the point of uh, this first concept and technology that uh, I'd like to introduce you today to. Um, we call this technology robust links. I see trying to find a way of robustifying our links in, uh, in web-based scholarly communication. So we're trying to make those links more robust and we're trying to do it in a way that's A, standardized, or based on standards, and be uh, friendly and actionable for machines. And this concept basically uh, uh, um, uh, relies on two steps um, by, uh, done by uh, several different parties, as you'll see in a second. The first step is, and that will probably not surprise you, uh, make a copy of your referenced uh, web page in a publicly available web archive. Uh, you probably recognize some of those icons here, there's the Internet Archive, that allows you to proactively make a copy, excuse me, make an archived copy of your web page. Uh, there's other archives that help you do that. Perma CC out of Harvard, for example, is a, is a really good example uh, with a really powerful archiving engine basically behind it. So that's your first step, right? Uh, while, for example, writing your article, make an archived copy of the web page that you're trying to reference in your article. Why do I list more than one? Well, there's no magic behind uh, uh, web archives. They're basically just websites uh, like others as well. Maybe some of you will remember mummify.it. It was a web archiving service as well. And uh, if you use that service, if you archive your web pages now, you get your eyes like the one on the bottom there. Uh, something cryptic. The service is gone. They did not figure out a business model. They're gone. So now you've created yet more uh, uh, references that don't work anymore, right? Hence, uh, the more better. All right, after your first step, after uh, creating that snapshot, the second step that I uh, ask you to do when uh, using robust things is to, to decorate your link while publishing. 
and uh, ask you to decorate your link with uh, uh, two additional pieces of information. So of course you use your original URL, the URL of the web page that you'd like to reference to. The second piece of information is the uh, URL of the archived snapshot that you just created. And thirdly, very importantly, uh, the date time of when you linked that article. What this can look like, uh, um, I'm showing you on, on, on this slide, uh, we're using HTML attributes, so those are standardized, right? browsers know them, browsers can, uh, uh, will not complain when you use those attributes, and they give you the power of conveying these three pieces of information. Uh, if you're familiar with HTML, you'll recognize, okay, you have the original uh, URL of the city of Albuquerque in this case, in the href attribute, that's your generic, your general link, and you use the attribute data version URL to convey the uh, URL of the archive snapshot that you just created. And the version date uh, holds the value of the date of linking. So what this buys you is, A, you can still click on the link on the original URL as is, assuming, hoping uh, that the resource that you reference to does not change. Secondly, you can use, if it, if it does change, if it breaks, for example, if it is subject to link rot, uh, you can use the uh, URL of the archive resource to uh, 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 obtain the archived copy of the page. Now, if uh, the original is gone, if the archive is gone, like Mummify is, for example, you still have a backup plan, you still have a plan C, which is you have the original URL and you have the date time, which are the two pieces of information that you currently need to look up archive copies elsewhere in yet a different web archive, right? Which you would not have if you threw away the original URL. Right, so some publishers argue that uh, they'd rather like to convey the, uh, um, the, the URL of the archive copy uh, only, and then you just switch it around, right? You put the URL of the archive copy in the href, and you use the original URL in the attribute data original URL. Again, that's completely standard. Um, that's HTML5. This is uh, easy to do for everyone. And not only, of course, for the author, but also for publishers, for you know, uh, uh, submission systems, all these sort of tools that can uh, use the technology to make their uh, references in scholarly articles more robust. And really quickly, one way uh, we demonstrate this to the world basically is an article that we published, or Herbert actually published, uh, two, three years ago in uh, Deal Magazine, which as you know uh, is HTML based. So there we created a few lines of JavaScript that, uh, and this might be too small to read, but uh, this, uh, they ingest a little icon next to every link, to every reference to a web at large resource. And if you click on that link, you get the options uh, uh, that represent the, the additional information that I just mentioned. So you can click on the uh, archived copy if you wanted to. You can uh, try to find this um, um, resource elsewhere in a different web archive if the archive that you used while publishing is gone as well. So to, to, to quickly summarize, the, um, I think the, the takeaways from this first uh, concept and the first technology, robust links, is that all resources on the web that we're increasingly so referenced to in our scholarly work are subject to reference rot. There's nothing we can do about this, right? It's just the nature of the web. We know it is dynamic. Uh, those resources are not under our control. They're not under the control of, you know, locks, clocks, portico, those sort of institutions. Uh, so they are subject to reference rot. That's just the nature of the beast. What we can do, however, we can re robustify our references by using a simple technology such as um, RoboSpace. And uh, beyond just making uh, 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 archive copies, we need to decorate our link to convey the notion that there is something else in case you know, the life resource is gone. And as I mentioned before, organizations such as publishers, uh, you know, your easy chair system, uh, every author can do this. Um, uh, organizations like Wikipedia were in, in contact with them to uh, try to push those, uh, these notions forward because, uh, again, we've seen, we've proven that reference rot is a massive problem in our, uh, in our times, in our scholarly communication world. Okay, so this was very quickly uh, uh, what I uh, it, it did not int initially intend to talk about, but um, again, uh, after talking to uh, to you to some participants yesterday, I felt this was important to, uh, to drive home as uh, a, a way of, you know, uh, the very simple standardized technologies uh, increasing our, um, basically, reliability of our systems. Right? 
Right, so what I'd like to talk about next is what we call uh, signposting. And signposting, basically as the name gives away, is our proposed method of showing machines the way around repositories. And I, I, I hope that I'll be able to explain in more detail what this means, what this, uh, how this can work. Um, and we'll start with this. I'm, I'm sure all of you know what this is. It's a DOI. Right? Uh, what do you do with a DOI? Well, not much. <laughs> you can't do much with this as is, right? What you do with the DOI is you transform it into something like this. That's an HTTP version of that DOI. That is something that your browser understands that you can deal with. What your browser does, I'm sure you know this, when you ask uh, uh, um, the browser to, to uh, dereference this, is it redirects you uh, in uh, uh, many, many cases to what we call the landing page. So that now is the landing page hosted by uh, Pangea, in this particular case, a, uh, a data archive in Germany. Um, has nothing to do with the, uh, uh, the DUI anymore, so this is hosted by Pangea, right? Okay, so what this page looks like, just to give you an example, is this. That's what we call a landing page. It's where you end up when you dereference your HTTP version of your DUI, right? And what I can do now, I can look at this page, I can say, oh, this is, this is nice. They are my authors. These are the authors that have contributed uh, to this work. I can see those, I can you know, look at the names, I can identify them. I also uh, recognize the DUI on that page um, again, it's not the HTTP version of that DUI, it's just the DUI, so there's not much I can do with that, but I can see it, I can identify it. In addition, and this might be too small to read, there are three buttons down here that give me uh, various representations of the citation uh, of this scholarly object, right? This is the notion of, if you'd like to cite this uh, data set in particular, this is how you do it in bib tag, in uh, plain text, so on and so forth. So additional information about the scholarly object that I, as a, as a reader, as a user of this uh, landing page, can see, can extract, can interpret. If I scroll down on this page, I get a link uh, that offers me the download of a zip file uh, with all constituent resources that make up the scholarly object identified by this UI. Um, again, as a, as a user, I can click on it, I can download the data, I can interpret it, I can uh, um, analyze it, I can uh, you know, uh, try to achieve some sort of uh, reproducibility, I can do all that. And uh, uh, further down, uh, the, the data sets that make up this scholarly object are listed there. So that's all great, that's all good. Uh, and I can do this, right? Uh, as I mentioned throughout the last few slides, I can, uh, uh, I can copy and paste the DRI from that landing page, I can try to resolve it uh, against uh, DRI.org. Uh, I can determine uh, who the authors are, can, uh, extract the bibliographic information and uh, metadata around it. You'll believe me if I go back to uh, this page that there are other links on those landing pages that have nothing to do with the scholarly object identified by that DOI, right? There are links to, you know, Facebook and, and Twitter and uh, uh, the, maybe the, the, the web page of other related services, but not necessarily related to the scholarly object identified by the DOI. Okay, so I can do all these things as a user, as a human. And that's exactly where the problem comes in, because a machine can't do any of that. Right. Uh, your crawler, for example, your robot that tries to analyze your, uh, uh, your, skull, your repository, tries to connect the dots, basically, between repositories, or even within a re repository, you can't do any of these actions that I just did uh, as a human uh, user. Um, and so our proposed solution, our signposting approach, uh, is trying to address exactly that problem and provides a solution that is based on HTTP links. And I'll, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with HTTP links, I'll explain in a second to what that is and how that works. But it's, um, again, a method that is based on standards. as an RFC. It's actually, uh, this is actually not the first version of RFC, so link <coughs> HTTP links have been around for, for quite a while. And the way it works is as follows. Imagine a scenario where you have two resources on the web. On the left you have resource one, on the right you have resource two, and there's a link between these two resources. Uh, and assume further place that uh, resource one, identified by URI1, describes 
the resource to, which is identified by URI2. Right? For example, URI1 could be a metadata record about the PDF publication, let's say, or publication of PDF form uh, identified by URI2. So one describes two. That's a relationship. And if we now send an HTTP request against URI1, URI1 could actually tell us that it describes URI2. The way we do this is by uh, including HTTP links. Right, so highlighted here in red, it would say, if I, if I send an HTTP GET request against URI1, it could come back with the response headers, and the response headers would include a link that says, me, I, uh, URI1, I describe URI2. Right. So it's basically a way of putting semantics in linking on the web. That's one way of looking at this, okay? So that's not a abstract sort of a concept. This is being used all around the web. Uh, an example is uh, this, the DBpedia page from, uh, about the city of Albuquerque. Um, this is the response headers when I sent an HTTP request against the DBpedia uh, uh, page. And we see several link headers there in use. One of which is uh, conveying the notion that there is a license statement about this resource. And, uh, uh, the, uh, it, provides the, the notion of uh, rel equals license, which means the relation type of this link is of uh, type license, and it has a, a, a URI endpoint that this is the license about the Albuquerque page of Wikipedia. Right. There are other links, for example, uh, links for the rel type of the relation type alternate. That gives you an idea of, uh, well, you reached uh, the, the wikipedia.org slash data slash Albuquerque web page in a representation that is RDFXML, don't worry about it. Uh, however, there's an alternate to this page. If you don't like this representation, you can also uh, uh, obtain a representation in format JSON, if you prefer that. That's an alternate to the um, uh, URI that you refer dereferenced. And a third uh, um, example here is the um, <coughs> relationship type it describes, as I showed you earlier. This gives you a notion of um, there's another resource <laughs> that describes the resource that I just um, dereference, right? So my point here being uh, HTTP link relation types give you a semantic notion of links. Right? Kind of explain those links to machines uh, in a way that is readable and interpretable uh, not just for humans but also for machine. All of these relation types that I just showed you and many many more are registered uh, so they are uh, standardized which means that if I'm publishing a link that the relation type describes relation type describes, and someone else publishes a link for the same relation type, we know that we're talking about the same things. It's not the same, we're not describing the same object necessarily, but we're conveying the notion that we're describing uh, resources. So these IANA uh, 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 rel types are registered, uh, they are standardized on the web, uh, they're usually verbs that are you know, parsable, that uh, people can read and intuitively <coughs> understand. And, um, uh, they um, usually require, require a te technical specification to be adopted in the community. So you need to write a technical document, an RFC, to make your case that you need a, uh, a new relation to, uh, if, uh, if you have a particular use case that is thus far not covered by existing relation types. Okay? And these are pretty neat. Uh, they're pretty neat for several reasons. Well, first of all, it does not matter what MIME type your resource is, you can always include these HTTP uh, uh, headers and uh, relation types. It doesn't matter whether you're describing a PDF document or a PowerPoint or what have you in your repository, right? They're agnostic of the MIME type. In addition, and that I think is a really good uh, benefit, a really uh, um, uh, a positive thing on uh, uh, HTTP links is that you do not need to send an HTTP GET request against the resource in order to get the headers, right? You can set an HTTP HEAD request, so there's no content transfer, that's my point. You can send an HTTP HEAD request against a uh, two terabyte document and you would get the, uh, the response instant instantaneously, right? Your machine does not need to transfer the two terabytes in order to get the uh, HTTP uh, response headers. That's a huge benefit. The other one is, you can configure your system in a way that machines and other users would still be able to obtain those HTTP response headers even if your resource was embargoed or behind a, a firewall or somehow other, in, in some other, other way uh, locked up. 
Right? So there is still the notion of interoperability even if your resources are behind uh, closed doors. If you find yourself, and that's a very abstract use case, I think so far anyways, if you find yourself in a, in a situation that you have just too many of those uh, 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 link headers, you can bundle them and just uh, include a by reference um, uh, to, to uh, the, the actual re representation of all link headers. But that's, uh, I have the reference for, for the RFC if you're interested in that sort of um, exploration. Okay, so what we're trying to do now, coming to, uh, back to our uh, proposal for signposting. We're proposing to use those sort of uh, HTTP link headers uh, to address very common, very bothersome problems in scholarly communication. Problems. The first pattern that we have is uh, going back to the uh, DUI problem. I am on my landing page, I got there, my browser redirected me there. How do I know what the DOI is of this scholarly object that I'm looking at? That's a machine. Machine has no idea, right? So that is a problem for several different reasons, uh, two of which I have here on the slide. One is, uh, we have seen, and I'll get to this in a second, we've seen that a lot of authors do not use DOIs when they're citing scholarly articles. Because they use the URI of the landing page. Because that's what you do, right? You, uh, uh, key in the DOI in your, in your web browser, you be redirected to the landing page, you copy and paste the URI into your scholarly article, you're done. Um, and that makes life for uh, altmetrics, for example, very, very difficult, for citation uh, accounts, very, very difficult, because the URIs of landing pages change all the time. DOIs are supposed to not change, uh, so there's a disconnect there. Uh, another example that I have here is uh, annotation services that become increasingly more popular. Hypothesis is an example. If I annotate a paragraph on this landing page, uh, citation services that connect to other clients will not be able to make that connection if someone else had published uh, an annotation on the, same uh, on the same paragraph, for example, if it was just identified by the landing page URI and not by the DUI. Right, so we need a common denominator, that's what DUIs are for. The, uh, the, the way uh, we'll propose the solution here is to use this site NS um, relation type and it can, can go the following way. You have your DOI on top, the DOI redirects to the URI of the landing page and the landing page, as I showed you for the uh, Pangaea example, links to its constituent <coughs> resources. Right, so the publication, for example, in HTML format, uh, the publication in PDF and uh, there's an EPUB version as well. So if now the landing page would have an HTTP link that points back to the DUI and say, this is my DUI, this is the thing that identifies me uh, generically all across, uh, that would help a machine to identify there's a real connection between the landing page and the DUI. Same thing goes for the publication in HTML. If I, for example, just uh, have the URI of the HTML version of the publication, how do I know what the DUI is? I don't. But the, uh, the resource, the HTML resource could link back to the DOI and this is my identifying PID. And very briefly, an example of what this can look like. Uh, Pangea actually is one of the early adopters of our signposting approach. Uh, if, you re uh, um, uh, if you send an HTTP request against um, uh, the landing page URI, uh, DOI.pangea.de and so on and so forth, it does have a link in the response headers that says, uh, uh, this resource is to be cited as uh, this DOI, that's my identifying object, okay? That's the link back to the DOI. So I mentioned that, I claimed, basically, that authors increasingly so use uh, the URIs of landing pages rather than the DOIs in their citations. And uh, we've proven this, actually. We've shown this in a uh, publication at the World Web Conference a couple of years ago. Uh, related to the PLOS1 um, uh, articles that I showed you earlier, we try to eliminate all uh, references to scholarly articles. And naively, we thought it would be sufficient to just filter uh, all links that start with dx.di.org, uh, because that would be DOIs. Well, uh, yes, but. Uh, we found a ton of links that go like link.springer.com slash article slash something else. And that exactly is the URI of your landing page, right? That's not your DUI, that's not how you're supposed to cite scholarly articles, but that's what authors do. Uh, 
so we, we used a, um, a crossref reverse lookup service to identify those as well in order to, to uh, eliminate that. The point being, um, we, we, we see a lot of uh, URIs of landing pages in scholarly articles that should be DOIs. And that's represented here by the, uh, by the red line. Again, over time, articles over time, references over time. Uh, everything that's red should actually be blue. And hence, it's called, you know, should be DOIs. Those are references to scholarly articles or objects that have a DOI. Hence, should be referenced by the means of its DOI, but they are not. So that's a real problem. The second pattern that I'd like to uh, show you is what we call publication boundary. I showed you on the landing page of Pangea that the landing page links to uh, zip files, uh, links to um, uh, uh, other objects that are uh, part of the scholarly uh, object at, at large that's identified by DUI, the constituent resources. Uh, if I end up again on the uh, on the, on the uh, URI of the HTML representation of the article, I have no idea where my constituent resources are. The most important use case for this pattern, we believe, is the um, notion of uh, for preservation services, so locks and clocks, for example. They continuously uh, have their crawlers. I try to interpret the landing pages of uh, scholarly publishers, trying to find where is my PDF where is my other resource that belongs to the scholarly object that I am supposed to, to archive, right? Again, me as a human, I can look through the page, I can identify a PDF, that's fine, the machine cannot do that. So here the, the problem is, or the notion is, uh, we're trying to convey information of what objects, what constituent resources belong to the scholarly object. The way we propose to do this is by using uh, HTTP link, header, uh, link types, relationship types, item, and collection. That's what this can look like. If a landing page linked to, for example, in the HTML version of a, of a publication, a PDF, and uh, some uh, constituent resources on the, on the left there, with the relation type uh, item, I would be, as a machine, would have a clear indicators, clear signs where to go in order to grab and archive those constituent resources, right? But that also is a bidirectional uh, sort of relationship. These constituent resources may as well a link back to the landing page that I am part of this collection that we see over here. Right? So that's a, a two-way sort of an interaction that's possible. Similarly, a two-way but yet different uh, way of interacting is uh, the con conveying the notion of bibliographic information about a scholarly object. Uh, the use case is similar. Can also be can also envision um, locks and clocks as preservation services trying to archive more than just the PDF but also uh, bibliographic information, metadata about the object that can be provided from the uh, repository itself or from other services, from external services like Prosser, for example. And here we have the bidirectional link relation types uh, describes that we saw earlier and described by, which goes in the other direction. And it can look like this. Right? So again, your, uh, your DOI may have a link to, let's say, the uh, Crossref uh, provided metadata record about this scholarly object that identifies, and it uh, uh, annotates basically that link with the relationship type described by. So I, the DOI, am described by this metadata record provided by Crossref. And of course, that uh, a re relationship goes the other way around as well. The metadata record can say, I am describing, I describe this guy over there. Right? So again, bidirectional. Uh, relationships that can be conveyed very easily with uh, uh, two standardized uh, rel types, relation types, described and described by. Uh, the last pattern that I think is really important as well that I'd like to come here is the notion of an author. I, I've seen, I've shown you the landing page of Pangea. The uh, list of authors and contributors is, uh, uh, is printed there. Uh, but there are names, and we all know names are horrible uh, identifiers when it comes to um, distinguishing between author A and author B, right? Uh, which is why we have uh, um, ways of uh, going around this, as you'll see in a second. So how does a machine know, and it comes also back to the notion of alt metrics and citation count and so on and so forth, how does a machine know uh, who the authors were on a random HTML representation of a publication, right? There's no way. Well, no way other than parsing the content and trying to do all kinds of crazy things um, with the strings extracted. 
So the pattern here is uh, fairly simple. <clears throat> Both the DUI and the landing page could have a link uh, to, an, to a URI that identifies, uniquely identifies an author. And uh, what would be better, uh, one solution that we have, uh, as I'm sure you know, is uh, ORCID. So here again is an example um, from uh, Pagea. I dereference the URI of the landing page, and um, as part of the response headers, the link headers, uh, Pagea tells me that the person identified for this ORCID was the author of this scholarly object. Right? So again, a very, very simple yet powerful way of conveying additional information that is parsable, that is interpretable by machines and not just by humans. Okay, putting this all together. We have our scenario for uh, uh, scholarship right now, for, for publication, let's say. We have our uh, HTTP version of the DOI that redirects to a landing page that has, in this case, three constituent resources, and then there's some metadata stuff there on the right. So let's uh, uh, reflect the sort of patterns that I just went through. Uh, we have the site as relation type to make a connection between the landing page and the DOI. So if you end up on the landing page as a machine, you know exactly what the DOI is uh, that identifies the scholarly object. And hence, you can convey that information. In addition, if you have uh, the landing page and you want to know what the constituent resources are that belong to the scholarly object, uh, you have links that go out to these uh, individual uh, resources right now, and they're labeled with the relation type item, conveying the notion these belong to me, me as being the scholarly object. And in reverse, you have the notion of I am a constituent resource, and I belong to this uh, uh, scholarly object, the landing page, for example, that is identified by a particular uh, DUI. And then you have the described by. Uh, notion as well, which you can, can link from the uh, DOI and also from the landing page. And again, these are uh, resources that, uh, that describe me. So the, the bib tag, for example, uh, is uh, describing the landing page. The landing page is described by the bib tag metadata resource. Okay. And last but not least, of course, the author uh, relationship. I'm a DOI. Here is the ORCID. Uh, record of the author that is responsible for me uh, being here, basically. So, <clears throat> what this does for machines is a is following uh, the principle of follow your nose. Right. So you you have the DUI, you have the URI of the landing page, and a machine can follow links in order to uh, accumulate all this information about the scholarly record. Uh, so a machine can basically mimic what I did earlier on the snapshots for the Pagea landing page that I showed you identify the author, can grab all the constituent resources that I need, can identify the different representations of the, of the article, let's say, that's there. But those are just a handful of um, relation types that we can use and examples and patterns that I uh, outlined. There's other, there are other use cases that, um, that are being thought about and that are, of course, possible. One of which is uh, license. You've seen this earlier. Uh, so we know of repositories that think about conveying license uh, statements about uh, uh, objects that they're making available to the public. Versions is another one. Um, if you if you have if you're a content management system, for example, you have to have several different versions of your wiki. Let's say you can link to those previous versions. So if you end up on the, the most recent recent version, but you're actually interested in the version from you know uh, two days ago, three years ago, you can uh, link those as well. And you can specify uh, the resource types as well. So if you, for example, link to a BibTeX uh, metadata record, you can convey that information as well. Hey, machine, this is a record that is related to me, and it's of type uh, uh, tech, for example, or text. Or uh, this is a JSON uh, uh, object that you'll find over there at the endpoint of this link to prepare a machine of what it needs to do to parse the record linked to. And very briefly, a shout out to uh, the core uh, next generation repositories. Uh, I will not uh, read this slide to you, of course, but I've just uh, copy and pasted uh, snippets of their uh, vision uh, statement and objective statement that I believe is very much aligned with what we're doing here. Uh, it's not a coincidence because especially Herbert is uh, uh, involved in that uh, movement as well. The point here being is uh, the vision of having repositories be uh, uh, this, this notion uh, of uh, 
part of the web uh, using web principles like follow your nose, using HTTP link headers, uh, something that any, everyone can do that's very simple to do, doesn't cost anything really, and can be uh, fairly power powerful. Okay, to uh, wrap this second part up as well, um, the use of HTTP links headers and their relation types, which again are standardized. I know exactly what it means when I see a link that the relation type describes because it's standard. Uh, are, uh, can be used to address very, very co uh, common problems in the scholarly communication field. Right? Uh, we have seen several different uh, patterns that can be addressed by these technologies. And it really, if used uh, consistently, uh, if used um, uh, in compliance to standards, it can be a very powerful mechanisms to make our repositories more centric to the web, more friendly to machines, and ultimately uh, provide uh, the basis basically of third party and other services to come and build added value services on top of uh, the repo repositories that we're providing as, as publishers, as academics, uh, as libraries, as archives, um, and so on. So with that, I'll close here. I, was, I hope I was able to Convince you of the three things that I wanted uh, to convince you of. A, um, these technologies really address uh, uh, very, very prevalent problems in our realm. They're very simple to implement. They're standard, so we'll, we'll, we'll be compliant with others that do the very same things. And they do, uh, if, uh, if implemented, they do us a big favor, can do us a big favor, and can make our uh, repository so much more user-friendly because they're more friendly to machines. With that, I thank you for your attention, and um, there might be some time for questions, so I'm happy to, to answer those. I'm going to ask the stupid question. Um, we've been uh, forced to move over to an HTTPS environment, and I just want to make sure that everything you said about HTTP equally applies to HTTPS, right. and there is nothing else that we need to think about because of that. <laughs>